I don't need a mic. No, I don't need a mic, but they want to record me, so this is why I'm standing in front of the mic. So this is a regenerative nanomedicine in room Rio, and we start a program right away because we are already running late. Uh, and we'll start our, our session uh, with Bert Müller from the University of Basel, who is going to talk about artificial muscles based on nanotechnology. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to give a talk about the treatment of incontinence uh, using nanotechnology. And it is a collaborative initiative of different partners, but I like to rely on the activities that are going on in my lab. So uh, mainly, it is sponsored by the NanoTerra initiative. Um, the smart sphincter muscle for, uh, uh, for the treatment of incontinence is a difficult thing because uh, the medical people believe that uh, it is a complex muscle, it's not a simple one. Uh, you see here uh, a short sketch and you see that there are different muscles included. So from a medical and anatomical point of view, it is one of the most complex uh, muscles. On the other hand, if we have a look from the engineering point of view, it's very simple. It's usually closed and only open uh, for a restricted period of time. So it's even simpler as a water pipe because uh, here we can regulate also the flow that is not even necessary for, uh, for this device. So therefore, uh, we have to define the target specification of a biomimetic design. So we have some anatomical restrictions that are related to the uh, geometry within the human body but also related to the comfort, so if you sit down or so, it should not, should not help. We have to know the necessary mechanical parameters, so that is uh, mainly the forces that act onto the uh, uh, fecal canal and the necessary pressures. For sure, in the case of stress incontinence, there is the time response that is also very critical, more critical for urinary than for fecal incontinence. So we have to choose the right actuator, and the actuator should, uh, should be rather simple. Uh, uh, one of the simplest systems that is in, in clinical use today uh, is very simple. So we have here an inflatable cuff that is uh, surrounding the organ. And then with a mechanical pump, the patient can pump some of the liquid from the cuff to the reservoir, and then it goes back after a certain period of time and closes it again. This is very simple. There's no uh, electrical uh, uh, supply necessary. Um, it works uh, in a quite uh, good manner. Nevertheless, uh, it doesn't really work in clinical practice. And one of the reasons is that the pressure uh, is always constant, so we cannot easily adapt it. Uh, so that is one of the, of the critical problems. In addition, I have to tell you that uh, it's still a big problem. If we look for the fecal incontinence that the project is dedicated to, then uh, nearly 10% of the people aged uh, over 60 years uh, suffer from fecal incontinence, and that has a really negative impact on the quality of life that usually results in social isolation. And you see here the, the values for Switzerland. So uh, it is an increasing number of patients who have a problem, and such a simple device will not really help them. So therefore, uh, one should have a look onto the international market, what are the developments. So uh, in principle, the design you have seen here, this is a little bit better design, but still the same, uh, the same problem. And then there are some more sophisticated designs that are not in clinical use yet, but uh, sometimes in animal experiment phase. What is the, the, the big reason why the people try to develop something? And one of the reasons is that, uh, yeah, the device doesn't work uh, in an appropriate manner. What you see here is uh, this uh, part, 
And if you look to in, into, the, into the body, you see it can have a big size. So you see it goes from uh, a few 10 milliliters to uh, more than a liter. So uh, uh, these are problems because uh, some of the liquid can uh, go uh, through the material. Therefore, the people try to uh, improve the design. Here's one design that is based on shape memory alloys. And uh, just having a look here, you will have an impression that it is not really uh, working uh, very well because we have some uh, forces, although uh, some differences in the forces, although there's a silicon uh, ring in between. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this, I, from my point of view, will not really work. There's another project with a micro pump that will work, but still uh, the micro pump is not very fast, so it cannot really overcome the bigger problem of uh, stress incontinence or gas incontinence. So therefore, uh, we have developed some devices to investigate uh, the, the, the stress incontinence, and we have used uh, for that purpose a universal testing machine. You see it here, and this is uh, in principle uh, the volume where we can uh, act on uh, to produce a certain pressure pulse that is acting uh, on something that we can uh, put here, uh, for example, in the case of, of urinary incontinence. Uh, here you see the comparison between measurement and uh, simulation. So this is a profile obtained from a patient. Uh, this is a problem from the, uh, the profile from uh, the testing machine. And you see in both cases we can fit the data with a Lorentzian. So therefore uh, we are able to simulate these uh, cuffing profiles. Uh, we want to have something that is quite fast, uh, that is reliable and, and should help us. And one of the actuators that are promising are the electrically activated polymers or the EAPs. And uh, usually the EAPs consist of a polymer that is in between two electrodes and applying a voltage, the polymer is laterally enlarged and therefore changes its shape. And silicone is one of the appropriate polymers because it is incompressible but uh, deformable. Such devices are in use in robotics, but usually the voltages are much higher than given here, so in the kilovolt range. And if we want to go into the range of uh, several volts, we have to reduce here the thickness, so usually below one micron. Uh, so these EAP uh, actuators are self-supporting, they show an adequate length change or a strain of uh, yeah, easily several 10 percent. It has a very low electrical power consumption and materials are available. The only problem we do have is the large actuation voltage in the kilovolt range and therefore we believe that one can produce a sandwich structure uh, to overcome uh, that problem. And doing so, we have to produce, let's say, thousands, ten thousands, or even hundred thousand of layers, depending on uh, on the uh, on the strain and stress we want to apply. And uh, in this case, we can go down to 30 volts or even even below. But uh, what we should have in mind is that uh, there are not only the the polymer that is necessary, but also the contacts. And uh, the polymer has a, a low Young's modulus that is appropriate. But uh, if you use gold, for example, we have to consider the Young's modulus of gold. And therefore, the gold electrodes, even they are, let's say, two orders of magnitudes thinner, uh, determine the mechanical properties and therefore uh, will uh, have problems in realizing such a device. Another problem, if you put gold onto silicone, you see that there are produced some uh, wrinkle structures. And uh, these wrinkle structures are seen not only for gold on silicone, but you can also t uh, take titanium on silicone, on, on uh, silicon wafer. And again, you see uh, these uh, wrinkle structures and, and uh, deep uh, defects. So um, uh, that is a, is a big problem in the preparation. And the reason behind are the different thermal uh, expansion coefficients of the metal and the elastomer. And one can easily describe uh, the period of, uh, of the wrinkles uh, formed 
uh, because they really depend on the mechanical and the geometrical parameters as well as the, the thermal uh, treatment. So therefore, uh, yeah, one has to, to think about and uh, before I like to start to think about these uh, um, wrinkles, I like to show you how we do measure the uh, mechanical deformation of an EAP structure. And for that purpose, we use a, a peak cantilever, let's say 25 microns in, uh, in thickness, and we put on the, uh, the, the silicone with the two electrodes and maybe on the other side, a reflective layer. Uh, and then uh, we put it into such a device where we produce a laser beam. Uh, the laser beam is reflected at the free end of a cantilever and uh, detected on a position sensitive detector. And thereby, we are very sensitive and we can measure the bending, that means uh, the displacement of a, of a laser beam on the detector as a function of applied voltage. And you see that uh, the banding depends on the thickness and the preparation procedure of uh, the metal as well as uh, the film thickness of the silicone layer. If you are interested in to see more uh, in this uh, paper, we have uh, published uh, many of these results. So the challenge is to produce a stretchable electrode uh, for dielectric EAP-based actuators. Uh, and here we have to uh, think for new things. So one is maybe to realize such wrinkles. You see them here, but uh, not in an arbitrary um, manner, but in an unidirectional way. And we are able to do so already. And the other is uh, maybe to use liquid metal electrodes or metal electrodes with uh, surface, uh, surface liquid. And uh, that had been demonstrated for the micrometer scale in US, but uh, not yet for the nanometer scale. So we do not know if this really will work, but uh, this is one of the things we are uh, dealing with. Uh, the other thing is we want to see something about the conductivity that is a critical issue, especially uh, for, uh, for the uh, uh, time response of uh, the device. And here you see the bulk resistivity versus the layer thickness measured by a master student from ETH in our lab. And what you see is it's usually a constant value, but uh, going below 14 nanometers, uh, the resistivity increases. So what we can say uh, below 10 nanometers, uh, we do not really have a film, and therefore we have to use a thickness of at least uh, 10 nanometers if we rely on the deposition we, uh, we have used so far. And we have applied uh, it to the whole geometry, for example, and you see that we can even bend our structures so that we can measure the, uh, the resistivity or the conductivity <laughs> during the application of strain to the structure. And that is a critical issue because usually defects uh, uh, occur due to that, uh, to, uh, to the application. Nevertheless, uh, we are not uh, really at the starting point uh, as for the actuators, but what you see here is a prototype of a urinary incontinence uh, sphincter we have developed uh, with the um, company Meyer Powers. And uh, here, what you see, we have different cuffs, so not only one, maybe two or even more. And then we can uh, uh, prevent the tissue damages by the application of one and the other and so forth, or maybe both together in the case of, of stress incontinence. And uh, this is in uh, clinical testing now. So uh, I think these uh, low voltage dielectric ARP nanostructures we are going to uh, prepare are not only interesting to treat uh, fecal and urinary incontinence, they are not only used as actuators, but at the same time simultaneously as a sensor within the human body. So therefore, uh, uh, that is a very helpful um, application, a first application. You might know also that uh, artificial skin is one of the issues that is very interesting. We also think about hinge-less devices in robotics, uh, flow control in micro and nanofluidics. Uh, uh, so I think this project has uh, high risk, but a wide variety of uh, potential applications. 
And as you uh, know, we are working on a university, so here education and research, but we have a close link to industry and to the clinics, so material science uh, for human health. And finally, I'd like to thank all the, the sponsors of our activities. So uh, a previous uh, um, consortium uh, with, uh, with in the Swiss Nanoscience Institute, where is one uh, project related from the Swiss, uh, uh, Swiss National Science Foundation, and now uh, we are a big team uh, working within the NanoTerra initiative uh, uh, during the last year and two or uh, three years in addition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bert, for this very nice presentation. We have what I suggest is that we have that we do a couple of the more urgent questions right now, and then when we have time at the end of, of this session, then we can go in more depth if this is uh, asked for. So, are there any burning questions at this time right now? There are possible interference in patients with an implanted cardiac pacemaker. Um, for sure, um, always uh, there can be some interferences with other devices, not only with implanted ones. Um, therefore, it is very critical to develop the control of a system that has to be safe and only be changed uh, intentionally either by the patient or in a broader way by the physician. This device for the fecal incontinence, would it be adaptable to the defecation frequency or consistency of the stool, for example, in situations of diarrhea? Um, this is a very important question, and I have to tell you that the specification of the device is really difficult because the anatomy varies from women to men, from different ages, uh, different weights, uh, and so forth. And if you have a look into the literature, you will find uh, variations by factors. Yeah? So even uh, if there are some clinical studies, you will realize uh, they're very uh, broad scattering. And we have thought about, and uh, uh, what we realized, however, is that the pressures um, that are uh, present within the human body are rather constant with respect to all the other parameters. So um, I think that is, is doable, but uh, it also needs some additional experiments to, to answer your question. So would you then have to develop different types of devices for the different types of human beings, as you were saying, not only child versus adult, but also females versus males? Uh, that's true, and therefore we have included into our project two clinical partners who have a closer look to uh, the situation and they have to find out what are the key uh, applications we are looking for. And um, so far, what I have seen in, in the devices uh, that are available on the market, there are usually uh, three to five modifications. Uh, sometimes one can uh, change the size of a cuff, for example. One can also adapt the pressure within a certain extent, even during the growth of, uh, of a child or so. Uh, I think uh, that is doable, but it's a difficult way, so therefore I do not expect that we will have a solution within three years. <laughs> okay. If there are no more questions at this point, I would like to thank 